You are watching the 62nd edition of Worldview from Islamabad, coming to you from the headquarters of PTV Network, right here in the Pakistani capital. Now, talking about the Pakistani-American relationship is really never out of fashion. It's a vibrant relationship and it keeps reinventing itself. And on this show, of course, we've dedicated many editions to talking about this relationship. And today, I'm glad to have with me here in the studio the Ambassador of the United States of America to Pakistan, Ambassador Ryan C. Crocker. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for being here. Thanks, Mr. Qureshi. It's good to be back. Now, uh, first of all, Mr. Ambassador, I should take a moment out to say this. You have, by being here, have uh, in a way ignored the stringent security procedures that normally American officials follow while being here in Islamabad. And you're coming here, you're sitting here for the first time, uh, and uh, I'd like to thank you for doing that. Well, as I said, it's a, it's a pleasure to be back on the show. Um, and uh, uh, in spite of those stringent security procedures, I've been able to get around Pakistan a, a fair bit during my time here. Which is impressive because uh, in a way also, uh, and since we are of course approaching the time that uh, very soon you'll be leaving the country to take up your new post in uh, Baghdad in Iraq, um, it shows uh, how much you value the relationship that you've built here with the Pakistanis. And uh, I must uh, thank you for that. Well, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. This, um, when I was asked by my superiors to go to Iraq, uh, they started the conversation by saying that my long vacation in Pakistan was coming to an end. Oh, uh, interesting. And in, in many respects, I, um, uh, I feel the same way myself. Um, uh, it's been a lot of hard work, but I've enjoyed every minute of it. That's great. Now, as I was, you know, just before this interview, I was doing my research. And uh, as part of that research, I got in touch with a lot of people here in Islamabad, uh, people, uh, diplomats, uh, people uh, in the government, uh, uh, political activists and people in the media, people who would have met you or have seen you working very closely. And I was just trying to suss out, you know, what you know, the feelings are, you know, about you and how, you know, the have seen you work here. And I was uh, surprised. I mean, there was uh, an overwhelming, uh, you know, confluence of opinions coming to one point, really. I mean, most of them were saying you were an outstanding ambassador here, that uh, during your tenure you've uh, really built bridges here and uh, and they say you've been very exceptional in the way you've been also sensitive to you know uh, Pakistani feelings here uh, I talked to different people and people related to, to me different occasions in which you've been very sensitive very understanding but of course of course at the same time you were doing your job uh, you were doing it uh, you know firmly and perfectly naturally and and especially uh, a lot of people as I was talking to them came up with this uh, event uh, right after the earthquake uh, October uh, 2000 uh, last year and and uh, it was it was uh, many of them said that that you played an outstanding role in galvanizing the Pakistani American relationship to come to serve the people who fell victim in that earthquake so you know on behalf of many many people who asked me to convey you know their gratitude and their thanks to you for the role you played in building the bridges between Islamabad and Washington well, uh, thank you. Uh, they're very kind. The uh, earthquake is something none of us who are here will ever forget. Um, uh, the stunning, unbelievable news that 75,000 Pakistanis had perished in, in two minutes um, is still something that uh, a year and a half later is, is almost impossible to comprehend. Um, it was our duty to step forward, and um, I'm just glad we were able to help. And. Uh, I thank all those anonymous people out there who spoke kindly of me. I'm, I'm a little bit concerned that you were surprised by it. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was just, uh, you know, we, on TV you have to be a little dramatic, you know, so it's okay. Now, um, I'll go straight to the questions, uh, Ambassador. Now, of course, there are a lot of points in our relationship, uh, the Pakistani-American relationship. Now, one of the high points uh, recently was the visit of Vice President uh, Dick Cheney, he was here. Now, uh, while he was here, when he left, of course, there were many reports talking about a tough message that was delivered and, and so forth. And of course, uh, later on, uh, some uh, American uh, spokespersons, uh, the White House, uh, they you know played down those reports and that, and also some Pakistani spokespeople as well. Now, you were with uh, the Vice President while he was here. What's the real story? Uh, well, the real story is just what you heard from people speaking officially, including a senior official on the vice president's plane uh, who said he was surprised by these reports of a 
tough message from the vice president because that isn't the vice president's style. Um, it's also not the style and tenor of this bilateral relationship. Uh, we face a lot of hard, complicated issues. We face them together. Uh, the vice president came here to consult on uh, what the best way forward is uh, for us, for Pakistan, for Afghanistan, in this difficult border region. Uh, but that's what it was. Uh, it was a process of evaluation, of consultation. How do we go forward from here? Now, Ambassador, after the 1980s and the, the war in Afghanistan, the Soviet uh, invasion and, and whatever came after that, now, these days, we are witnessing, of course, uh, very close Pakistani-American cooperation. And, of course, you know, a lot of people, I mean, this is an academic question, really. A lot of people talk about the kind of bridges we've built, uh, both nations back in the 1980s, both governments, people in government working with each other. And now we get another chance to really work closely. How would you describe, I mean, being part, of course, of all of this Pakistani-American uh, uh, dialogue and cooperation. How would you describe the uh, kind of understanding? I mean, do we understand each other? Do, do, do the American officials coming here understand the Pakistanis? And do the Pakistani officials understand the Americans? Do we have that closeness? Uh, I, I think this is a very important question. I, I certainly came to Pakistan in the fall of 2004, informed certainly by the, uh, the policy that President Bush and his administration had set toward Pakistan. But also informed by our history uh, of how we had a very close relationship in the 80s and then became estranged in the 90s and we had to rebuild it all over again after 9-11. Uh, so I think we need to be informed by our, our history, um, uh, the good parts and the not so good parts as we build for the future because what we're doing now I think is something different than what we did in the 1980s. Um, in the 1980s the relationship was effectively about a single issue which um, was getting the uh, Soviets out of Afghanistan. What we're doing now is something much broader and deeper and far more enduring. Uh, we're allies in the war on terror certainly uh, but that is by no means the totality of the relationship. Um, both our governments have worked very, very hard over these last several years uh, to build a multifaceted uh, relationship that concentrates on um, economic and social development in Pakistan, uh, that concentrates on educational exchanges, um, that focuses on Pakistan's constructive regional and international role. So I won't give you the whole long list because it is a long list. Um, we uh, might touch on those points during the conversation. But what you're saying that we, we have that kind of understanding, we do understand each other, is that what you're saying? Uh, certainly, government to government, uh, we've developed a very keen and thorough understanding, I think, of each other's uh, concerns, positions, uh, priorities. We have to keep working on broadening that to a people-to-people -people understanding. And some of these programs that we'll probably talk about later get into that because uh, for the long term, it's important not only that our governments understand each other, but it's important that our peoples understand each other. Now, uh, talking about understanding, uh, when you uh, came here, when you took up uh, the post here in Islamabad, uh, I read some reports in the media, basically, that uh, in, in the, within the State Department, uh, Islamabad was one of those, you know, no-go areas, one of those tough missions that many diplomats, you know, would, you know, try to avoid. Uh, I mean, uh, Ambassador Wendy uh, Chamberlain was a uh, superb ambassador here, but, you know, unfortunately she had to go because she had these personal reasons. But part of those personal reasons had to do with the fact that because of the war on terror being uh, waged uh, near and uh, in and around our region, uh, it was one of the factors that uh, made her consider uh, departing. You came here, you took a post, it's a tough position. Uh, and, and so my question is, is when officials take a position here, diplomats and things like that, uh, that's where you need to have clarity, where you need to have uh, things very clear and that uh, whatever perceptions or misperceptions that exist in the media need to be avoided and we need to be closer. I guess my question would be here is that uh, I hope that uh, the picture about Islamabad is clearer now uh, within the American diplomatic community. Well, I've certainly done everything I could uh, during my time here to, to try to paint the reality um, of, um, of Islamabad, um, of the government's uh, aspirations and orientations, of the challenges uh, that um, Pakistan faces, and what the way forward is. I've, I've also tried, uh, to the best of my ability, to convey here, both to the government and, and to the Pakistani people, how things look from our side of the ocean. Um, uh, 
Because again, I, I think Americans need to understand uh, maybe a little bit better than they do as they look at issues like the uh, border region between Pakistan and Afghanistan, the long, long history of that area, um, mm -hmm. how complex and difficult the issues are, how much Pakistan has done in the war on terror. Um, I don't think any country has done more. And the price that Pakistan has paid in the lives of its soldiers and law enforcement officials. I think Americans need to understand that a little bit better. A major, major effort by Pakistan against a very difficult problem. Um, I, I think, too, though, it's uh, important for Pakistanis to understand um, the long-term impact of 9-11 on Americans, uh, the most devastating attack in our history as a country. And um, uh, there is a fear on the part of Americans that that, that could be repeated, that um, our mm -hmm. common enemy uh, working from the border regions uh, still there, still active, still planning, would still like to strike into the heart of the United States. And uh, again, I think it's important that people here understand that, that that is very deeply felt in the U.S. Now, of course, uh, do, do you think uh, on the first part, uh, do you think we are making a good job here of explaining to the Americans what the situation is here? Uh, I, I think that is the case. Not just the official. I mean, I, I also, I'm talking about the media as well. Um, uh, I think there's, again, this is such a complex issue that um, uh, you, you can't do a single story and say, that's it, we've explained it. Um, uh, there has to be a certain iterative process in this, and um, because it is complicated, it maybe has to be done by stages. Uh, I think one important explanation is uh, one provided by the government in looking at the tribal areas and um, how to deal with them. Of course, uh, the government is now producing a, sustain, a sustainable development plan, uh, multi-year, um, for the tribal areas. Um, that, that gives an indication that this is a set of issues that have to be dealt with with a complex strategy. Now, we have tried to indicate very concretely that we understand that, and that's why we announced last week that to support the government's efforts to develop the tribal areas, um, uh, we are making a commitment of $750 million over a five-year period, $150 million a year beginning this year, 2007. Um, so the government's explanation of a complex strategy to deal with complex issues, I think, then helped us in turn uh, identify and commit the resources that will support that plan. In committing the resources, Mr. Ambassador, and in supporting that plan, of course, you're matching words with actions. Uh, uh, what do you say then about the, you know, what seems to be, you know, contradictory statements uh, and messages? You know, I don't know if there are messages. I mean, things like, you know, statements coming from some of the uh, U.S. commanders on the ground in, in Afghanistan and also from Washington, D.C. I mean, uh, we, you know, over the past few weeks, we've dealt with that, you know, statements, uh, uh, Mr. Necroponte's statement, for example, is one example that many analysts would code in this regard. Uh, so it, it seems like you know, contradictory messages and contradictory statements. Uh, uh, this is a concern that I'm sure you must have felt you know, here in Islamabad. What do you say to that? Uh, well, first, we have to be careful. There, there is a great deal that is said um, uh, here and in the U.S. One has to look at the sourcing. We, we talked about this just a moment ago, um, the attribution uh, given to the Vice President's visit to Pakistan, that he was coming to deliver a tough message. That was the way it was presented in the media. That was not reality. And official spokesmen later clarified that. So first we've got to differentiate between, you know, what is said by officials and what is speculated on by non-officials. As we look at statements by officials, uh, we have to look at them in context. Um, there are a lot of hearings going on now uh, mm. uh, on the Hill. Mm. These are normally lengthy affairs. Uh, what you often get is sort of a, a one-sentence headline out of a very whole, complex yeah, exactly. answer. Sure. So you've got to look at the whole thing. Mm. Uh, and when you do, I think you'll see that um, what uh, is being said by U.S. officials is not so very different than what has been said by Pakistani officials, including President Musharraf himself, in talking about the tribal areas and mm -hmm. uh, being very frank about the, um, uh, the presence uh, both of uh, Taliban elements and, um, and uh, Arab al-Qaeda supporters. Now, since we're talking about, of course, understanding each other and, and being careful in reading these statements and all, uh, there's this 
another thing, you know, reports uh, that uh, the, the U.S. House of Representatives uh, just passed a legislation. Uh, the U.S. Senate uh, is also uh, has also passed a legislation, and the first one, of course, uh, seemed to be linking uh, or recommending the future aid uh, to Pakistan by the U.S. government be linked to you know certain conditions. Uh, and the second one is, uh, appears to be there are various uh, analyses about that. You know, we we're not sure. Uh, but uh, the point is here, my, I guess my question here would be, um, n the ordinary people, the public opinion, don't have the luxury of time maybe or of uh, uh, resources to really analyze what's going on. What they do is this, you know, it's coming from America, from Washington, D.C., and well, you know, the, the both houses or one of the houses just passed legislation. They want to restrict aid, and it reminds people, you know, back, takes them back to the Presler Amendment days and, and so forth, you know. So, I mean, the people here, and, and of course, you must have heard many Pakistanis and read uh, talking about blackmail and good cop and bad cop and, and, and so forth. Pressure tactics. How do you respond to this? Uh, well, I've, again, I've heard it all, and I do understand the sensitivities. Uh, as we agreed at the beginning, this is a relationship that has a history. Um, uh, the 90s was not a good time for the relationship, and uh, what we have to do is commit ourselves to learn from that and not to repeat it, and I think that's just what we're doing. Uh, the, the House bill uh, did have a provision calling on the administration to certify that Pakistan was uh, making uh, every effort as an ally in the war on terror. Um, the administration can certify that in a heartbeat, um, but um, the administration opposes the language in the, um, uh, in the House bill because we simply do not believe uh, that there should be any requirement for that. Uh, Pakistan is an ally. It has demonstrated that uh, steadfastness in the blood of its soldiers, and we don't think there should be any provision requiring a certification. Now, you turn to the Senate side, um, again, it's complicated. Uh, the Senate version of the House bill contains no language at all about Pakistan. Um, now the two versions go to conference, and it will be the position of the administration that um, uh, the, the Senate version with respect to Pakistan should prevail, uh, and that's the outcome we hope to see. There is a sense of the Senate um, resolution or amendment um, that um, uh, uh, has language on Pakistan, mm -hmm. but it is non-binding. It does not require, it's a sense of the Senate. It mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, it therefore has no force. It does not require Pakistan to do anything, which it couldn't in any case. It does not require the administration to do anything. So while certainly aware of the sensitivities here and aware of the past, um, it's also important that people take a close look at exactly what is going on on the Hill, and to take a look at what the administration's position is. Um, I think we're in pretty good shape right now. That's great. Now, uh, State Department, uh, there was a report released by the State Department, uh, human rights situation all over the world, and there was, of course, this uh, report about Pakistan. And uh, there was a point in that report where, you know, Pakistan was criticized for detentions uh, that somehow, that, that did, did not meet the requirements of the law. and. Uh, and, and, and many Pakistanis fell, and I talked to officials and, and others, and they felt, you know, this is like, you know, those detentions, many of those detentions are actually uh, are connected to the war against terrorism, and they have to do with terrorism. And many felt, you know, I don't know, I, so whoever wrote that report was, I don't know, trying to look good and politically correct at the expense of us, and this is the exact word I heard from uh, somebody I spoke to. And, uh, and they felt, you know, this is a double standard. Well, I, th I think it's important to see it again in context. Um, uh, uh, indeed, that report uh, isn't saying anything that one doesn't hear uh, from Pakistanis themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the great things about Pakistan is the, uh, uh, the freedom of speech and expression and the, um, the passion with which people here exercise it. Nobody's shy about expressing a view. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've all certainly seen and read uh, the criticism and concerns that, um, uh, that Pakistanis themselves uh, have expressed in public uh, uh, on detention-related issues. Um, and indeed, much of what is in that report is drawn from uh, what is being said in the public debate here mm -hmm. about uh, detentions in Pakistan. But if I were in government, uh, Mr. Ambassador, I would expect you to understand my position a little better. 
uh, and not criticize because you know if I've gone, if I were the government and I've gone and, and done and been responsible for some of these detentions, it was because of the requirements of the war on terror. I mean, the U.S. government had to take some steps, like the Guantanamo Bay, be, you know, in order to and not to You got criticized for it. That's so. true, yeah, that's true. <laughs> you had to pay a price you know, in, in those terms. Well, I, I guess that's one of those points that you know, need to, and can be looked from different uh, angles. Now, uh, one more thing that I need to ask you here now, and that concerns, of course, the, the we've seen, of course, in in recent weeks, uh, I, I don't know, a better sort of relationship now uh, appearing to prevail now between Pakistan and Afghanistan. And of course, uh, the U.S. has played a role in that, of course, and, and there were many statements to that effect. Uh, the situation right now, briefly, be before I move on to uh, other questions, um, the situation right now in terms of, you know, we have this these reports about, you know, uh, the summer, the spring offensive and so forth. And a lot of work is going on behind the scenes to in order to preempt uh, that. Uh, what's going on right now? And uh, what are the future plans? The three countries are drawing the allies. Uh, they're working uh, on this point. Well, uh, you're, you're right, I think, in your analysis. Uh, there is a lot of uh, constructive uh, contact between Pakistan and Afghanistan. It also involves, as appropriate, the U.S. Uh, other NATO allies. Uh, I think the general trend now is, uh, is a positive one. Uh, and there are lots of examples. The, um, the two Jirga commissions have just met here um, in Islamabad. Very positive statements um, coming out of, um, of both commissions. There will be a return visit um, uh, by the Pakistani Commission, I understand, uh, in early April to continue the process. Um, that's encouraging. Mm -hmm. The uh, tripartite uh, military cooperation continues to be excellent um, at a variety of levels, dealing seriously and concretely with border issues of common concern. Um, uh, just this past week, we've seen um, uh, a delegation of women journalists coming over from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. There will be a return visit. So there is a lot going on in the relationship that is positive. And I think what that reflects is um, uh, the fact that Pakistan and Afghanistan have uh, essentially common goals for their countries and their peoples um, um, and face a common adversary. Now, in, in, in Afghanistan, uh, Mr. Ambassador, the U.S. relied a lot in the beginning, of course, and, and of course, sometimes the situation on the ground dictates certain courses of action, and one of those courses of, of action uh, uh, was the uh, heavy reliance on warlords. And of course, these <coughs> warlords were beneficial in one way, of course, if, you, if you're going to analyze the situation, but on the other hand, of course, they were the root cause of certain other ills that are now beginning to spread, uh, drug trade and crime and, and other things. Uh, so, I don't know, do you feel, I mean, many people in Pakistan who are concerned about our relationship also with Afghanistan and would like to see a, a stable Afghanistan. You, you just met yesterday, I think, the, uh, our interior minister, and he said, of course, we need to see a stable Afghanistan. Our entire plans for the future, for Central Asia, the Gwadar port, are based on Afghanistan. So uh, if we're going to say stability in Afghanistan, we need to you know, work also on those little things. And one of them is the warlords and, 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 and how to really rid the Afghan society in Afghanistan of, of that menace as well. You know. Well, I, I was in Afghanistan uh, shortly after the fall of the Taliban. You I, opened the embassy I there. I reopened the embassy yeah. there and, and, and uh, certainly came away with lasting impressions of the state of utter devastation that prevailed in much of the country. And um, it was, as you said at that time, that uh, uh, the writ of the central government uh, was pretty weak. Uh, there were warlords around the country. If you look at the situation now, five years later, it has changed uh, very much for the better. Um, um, if you look at Herat, if you look at Mazari Sharif, just to, to name two places where warlords once held sway, they're mm -hmm. gone. Mm -hmm. um, and not only are they gone, it was handled peacefully and politically. Uh, so while we still have a situation in which uh, Afghan institutions are, are developing, you, you cannot get from where Afghanistan was immediately after 9-11 to a fully developed state, uh, army, police, and everything else. You can't do that uh, overnight. It takes time. But I think the progress is very good. And uh, uh, the progress politically, I think, is encouraging. Again. The warlords are not what they were by any means, and if there is one single achievement of the um, 
uh, Karzai administration that I would really highlight. It's just that. Mm, that's a good point. So, I mean, gradually, and slowly and gradually, we're moving toward in a direction where at some point in the future, we're going to see less and less, as we move on, there'll be a less and less reliance on the warlords well, to I run Afghanistan. I, I think you've already seen that. Yeah. Uh, what, what, um, uh, what Afghanistan, Pakistan, and, and NATO are facing now really isn't so much the warlordism of the past as it is this, this uh, Taliban surge. Uh, now, I think we can deal with that. Um, uh, I think we just have to show resolve um, and cooperation among us, and we're demonstrating it. Um, the, the Taliban isn't going to win unless we kind of give up and let them win. Right. Uh, but that's not the warlordism of the, of, of the past period, and I, again, would um, commend Pakistan in that regard. Um, uh, we've all seen the reports of um, uh, recent arrests of a number of Taliban figures. I think that's very important. A lot of my colleagues, of course, in the U.S. media talk also about that, and and I think it's it's maybe lack of information. A lot of people say still, you know, we are still a dictatorship and all. We might not really, really uh, our model may not be uh, an exact copy of the American model or maybe the British model, the two main democracies in the world. But I think we are we are uh, as as an individual Pakistani citizen. I feel you know we've moved along. I mean, we have we never had uh, a media that was as vibrant as we have today, for example, and th th that's just one of the things, and women and, and so forth. I mean, sometimes even I, being a person who's, you know, uh, uh, sometimes get very surprised at, at how fast we've moved forward in the past five uh, or six years. And, and I think that, I feel that maybe my American colleagues need to better understand that thing. You know, you being an American diplomat, being here in Islamabad, what's your sense? Uh, well, again, it's uh, it's uh, another strand in this discussion we've been having, uh, the need to understand perceptions, realities, complexities. Uh, um, one of the reasons I've enjoyed myself so much being in Pakistan is because it's been such an education to me. Uh, Pakistan is very different from its uh, neighbors to the west where most of my experience is. Uh, and I, I always smile when people label this a military dictatorship. Um, I mean, you know, it's true the president uh, is an army officer, but this is not a dictatorship. Um, uh, democracy is important to us. <coughs> but more importantly, it's uh, also very important to Pakistanis. Um, and that is why, for example, when President Bush was here uh, and the joint statement by the two presidents was issued, uh, um, there was a, a very clear reference to uh, democratic development uh, uh, in which um, President Bush committed the United States to support Pakistan as it continues to build uh, strong and transparent democratic institutions and prepares for free and fair elections. Uh, that is the goal that President Musharraf has set uh, for Pakistan. It is clearly the right goal because I think the, the long-term stability of our relationship um, uh, is very much affected by it. And we've committed to, to try and support that, uh, uh, not by getting involved in domestic political issues, but by trying to help with things like computerizing voter rolls so that everyone will agree that it is an accurate, inclusive list of voters, uh, uh, providing uh, other assistance to the um, uh, election commission, uh, because these things are important. But ultimately, um, and I think this is a key point that we all have to understand, democracies have to be developed by the country and the people involved. Um, we have no model and no, no, uh, no right to, to stand here and say, this is what Pakistan needs. That's, that's for the Pakistani people. And so I, th I think that's a, a very important point. You use the word build as we build you know, our you know, democracy and all. And that's important because you know, we're, uh, we're moving in that direction and we're building the institutions, the things required to really have a successful democratic setup. And that, that's, okay, one more point, uh, Mr. Ambassador, is, and, and as we talk about the Pakistani-American relationship, uh, trade. And I understand, of course, we, that you know we've moved forward uh, in that. But one of the things that uh, I understand the Pakistani officials have been working on with the American officials is the is a free trade agreement, and and it seems to be very important because some of our products 
could find a, a, a very good market in the United States, and, and uh, uh, Islamabad is very keen on that because, of course, that'll also help us uh, economically. And uh, economy, and improving economy, of course, is one of the major you know, uh, uh, strategies uh, in fighting the war against terror, you know, uplifting people and all, so forth. Any progress in that regard? Because you know, there's a sense that the U.S. government is reluctant at the moment to move forward in, in that area, the free trade agreement. There's another uh, agreement uh, that I think the, uh, Washington is more keen on uh, for the time being. But uh, Pakistanis are looking forward to the free trade agreement. Well, first, uh, let me say you touch on something that is important, which is our commercial uh, economic and financial relationships. It's just one of many categories that we're working on to build a much stronger overall relationship. Um, um, and it's in good shape. Uh, the United States is Pakistan's largest customer. No other country in the world imports more from Pakistan than the United States does. And we continue to be your largest investor. Uh, we've got more money invested in Pakistan than any other single country. So mm -hmm. it's a pretty robust relationship. Um, and in terms of the trade balance, it's running about three to one in Pakistan's favor. Um, <laughs> really? So uh, <laughs> things are, are going pretty well as they are. But we clearly have an interest in, in building them further. Uh, you mentioned the FTA. Uh, where our focus has been has been on a bilateral investment treaty. Um, we think it's important in its own right. Um, uh, as much investment as there is now from the U.S., if we are able to successfully conclude a treaty, that volume will rise considerably to the benefit of both of us. But it's important also for another reason. The, a bilateral investment treaty is effectively the investment chapter of, a, of an FTA. Um, when we've done the, the investment treaty, we have finished a key chapter of the FTA, and then we can move on. You mean it's a building block? I, that's certainly how I see it. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we, can't, if we can't do the investment treaty, then uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to take on a whole FTA since you've got to have the investment agreement in any case. So uh, I think it makes sense for both of us to focus our, our efforts on getting that done. Then you have the investment piece in place and you can move on to look at the other areas of an FTA. Right. That's a good point. Any hurdles, by the way, uh, without getting into too many details, but any hurdles in, in securing the first, the bilateral agreement first? Well, uh, we're clearly not there yet. I mean, there are a couple of issues that we've got to resolve. Um, uh, these, are, these are very complex um, uh, considerations that uh, it takes a room full of lawyers to, to try and to interpret. Try, that's true. Uh, you mentioned Pakistan is, is, is way different than many of uh, our neighbors to the West, uh, the you know, broader Middle East region, and that's where you, of course, have most of your experience. In fact, you're an Arabist, you've, uh, you speak Arabic very well, and you spend time in, in some of the key countries in the region, uh, Syria, uh, Kuwait, uh, and other places, and, and you've been involved with the peace process with the Palestinians. Now, if, if, if I were, and you were in Kuwait as well, uh, you know, if, if I were to um, ask you, uh, you spent two and a half years here in Pakistan, uh, we share many of the characteristics of, uh, of our neighbors to the West, but some of the, you know, uh, the major differences that you found uh, in terms of you know, how we are moving forward. Pakistan, how much Pakistan is really different. I mean, we, we like to think, many of the Pakistanis feel that, you know, although we are a Muslim country, we are, uh, and, and we have, we share some of the problems that we see in the countries to our west, but we're also, you know, m moving fast forward. And, and we're trying to, you know, change some of the things that you really found different here uh, compared to your experience in, in, in the rest of the broader Middle East region. Well, there, there, I just would make a couple of totally unscientific uh, observations. Uh, uh, one, one thing that uh, any foreign visitor to Pakistan notices immediately is uh, the very widespread use of the English language. Uh, it is uh, one of the languages of Pakistan. It is taught in all the schools. It is the language of commerce. Uh, 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 the language of uh, intellectual circles. Uh, uh, one instantly feels that one is in a familiar environment uh, just because English is so wide, uh, wide spoken. And I think it's important because as you look to um, the global economic competition, the, the language of commerce internationally is English, and you have a tremendous advantage over 
uh, countries and businessmen who are not as um, um, well versed in the English language. Uh, the other, uh, another element that strikes, I think, visitors uh, coming to Pakistan is uh, uh, a very sophisticated, institutionalized framework <coughs> of government and governance. Uh, uh, the organization of uh, the various sectors of government, <coughs> uh, executive and legislative, uh, as well as judicial, are all very familiar to, um, to someone coming from the West. Uh, uh, over time, I think these institutions have, have become uniquely Pakistani, but their basic structure is quite familiar. And it makes it uh, that much easier for uh, Pakistan's friends, I think, to support uh, the goals the government is trying to achieve. Uh, for example, in um, uh, the legislative sector, um, although you're a parliamentary rather than a presidential system, <coughs> it is still a system that's very familiar to us. So. Uh, in response to Pakistani requests, we were able to fashion a <coughs> legislative strengthening program uh, to support the uh, development of capabilities in both the provincial and the national level assemblies. So I just, you yeah, know, would start way. with those two observations, but yeah. there are many more. Now, uh, before we conclude, just very quickly, you'll <coughs> be going to uh, Baghdad, to uh, Iraq. Uh, it's not the first time, of course, you were there immediately after the removal of Saddam Hussein. You were the number two person in the uh, Coalition Provisional Authority, the CPA, uh, after Ambassador Bremer. Uh, but still, I mean, the situation is so different. I mean, when we were first there, it was relatively calm. Uh, not maybe quiet, but calm. But now it's, it's one of the most dangerous places in the world today. And for an ambassador to agree to take a position there, you know, that sounds, I would say it's very brave. As a journalist, if I were told to go to, move to Baghdad right now, I, I might consider twice, although I spent three or four months there at that time, which was easy, really. So uh, your decision to move up there, I'm, I'm sure personally that must be a, a difficult one, I mean, in terms of family. Well, it's, um, there is no greater challenge, uh, I think, uh, for us in the world right now than in Iraq. Um, I, I have spent a lot of time in the Middle East. I, I do know something of the language, uh, the, col the culture, the, um, the political realities. So uh, if I can bring some of that experience to bear in a positive way, um, I'm, I'm ready to step up to it. Um, um, in terms of family, uh, you mentioned my time in Iraq in 2003. Um, I, I actually began my experience in Iraq um, a long time before that, uh, in the late 70s, when I was um, assigned there. And uh, in 1979, I met the woman who in Baghdad, who is now my wife. Uh, mm -hmm. really? We were both assigned to um, the U.S. intersection of the Belgian embassy, since we didn't have diplomatic relations. So, um, uh, inshallah, she will be going back to Baghdad with me this time as well. So. Um, uh, as we've done throughout our careers, we'll um, we'll take on this challenge together. So both of you, both both of you know Iraq very well and Baghdad very well, for that matter. We do. Oh, that's great. Now, what what would you do differently now, uh, as compared to, of course, the first few months after the removal of Saddam Hussein? It's so much complicated, so much difficult now. Well, it will be for the the think tanks, the pundits, and the historians to to look back and um, reinterpret history. I'm I'm not going to have time for that. Um, mm. uh, history for me will start when I get off the plane in Baghdad, and and uh, uh, I'll be busy with working out how we move forward. Uh, I think the president has set out a um, a very sound policy for this. Uh, it is clear at this juncture that the Iraqis must have the initiative. Um, there is a government, uh, there is an army, there is a police force. They've done a tremendous amount in four years to uh, develop institutions and capabilities on their own. Uh, and they are determined, as they rightly should, that they will show the way forward. Our role is to support them. And that's exactly what we're doing in the uh, current surge operation. Uh, uh, the Iraqis are providing the main military force. Um, the U.S. military is operating in support of Iraqi forces, um, but it's the Iraqis who are in front. Similarly, on the uh, political and the economic side, uh, the Iraqis have to set the agenda. They have to take the lead, um, and, and we have to support them. I think that's the, the main difference uh, now as opposed to four years ago. 
Of course, I'm going to just, uh, before your parting words, I'm just going to ask you a test question. I mean, I'm not sure many Iraqis will be watching us. ولكن إذا كان العراقيون يشاهدوننا الآن ما هي الرسالة التي من الممكن أن ترسلها لهم باللغة العربية؟ uh, والله أنا سعيد جدا uh, uh, أنا أرجع للمرة الثانية للعراق uh, uh, بلد uh, uh, كثير كثير مهم في, في العالم وللولايات المتحدة ورسالتي uh, يعني كلمة واحدة uh, uh, into Samadin, Mulana Samad. Awesome, impressive. Now, as you spoke, of course, uh, our viewers uh, saw the uh, subtitling in English uh, of that, you know. Now, um, parting words, really, uh, you'll be uh, very soon, of course, moving uh, to Baghdad. Uh, any last words you'd like to say? Uh, my time in Pakistan, uh, two and a half years, is, uh, is all too short. I, I would have uh, liked very much to prolong my stay here. Uh, it's a country that uh, is critically important to U.S. interests. Uh, but even more than that, personally, I've, I've just um, thoroughly enjoyed my time here. Um, the, it's a great nation. The Pakistanis are tremendously hospitable people uh, from the very top uh, down to street level. And uh, that's what will carry away with me, that uh, for all of our differences, sometimes in policy and perception, um, I have uh, neither I nor members of my staff have ever encountered um, uh, any street level anti Americanism, and I, I think that <laughs> speaks uh, uh, a great deal about the, uh, the innate hospitality and generos generosity of Pakistanis. That's very kind of you. Of course, one of the things about you, the lasting impressions I have of you, is that you know, you're, a, I think, a well formed man uh, with your interest in diplomacy and history and, and so many things uh, you also have a uh, deep interest in music and I was glad I saw you in the Middle East and, and you had uh, interest in music there and I in Pakistan I'm surprised that you also took interest in the Pakistani music uh, scene the, the Pakistani pop music and uh, you in fact were gracious enough to encourage that music by introducing the Americans to that music uh, holding a, a couple of events here that combined American audience with uh, Pakistani uh, rock or pop uh, bands. Uh, I thought that was really amazing and I think uh, you have really good taste in music because you know you listen to John Bon Jovi, one of my <laughs> favorite <laughs> singers, you know. I, I hope you enjoyed the Pakistani rock uh, scene here as well. Well, it's, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, my inclination in music tends toward the uh, heavier side of the rock spectrum. Um, uh, but in uh, the opportunities I had here with some of the Pakistani groups, I, I wasn't really doing anything new. I was building on uh, something that had been done before. And you, you probably recall uh, some years back, uh, the great Pakistani musician Nusrat Fatah Ali Khan uh, developed an association with uh, some major American rock groups. Uh, Pearl Jam was sure. the most prominent mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. part of the grunge rock movement of the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And they put together a fusion of um, American grunge rock and um, uh, classical Pakistani music that was just marvelous. And mm -hmm. I was very pleased to find when I got to Pakistan that that fusion uh, is alive and well. And more importantly than that, if you put Pakistani musicians and American musicians together, they'll rediscover it all by themselves. And um, I look forward to hearing a lot more of that. As yeah, I well, and we need to do that really to, to, to build those bridges. Ambassador Ryan C. Crocker, thank you very much. I uh, thank you very much for being kind uh, enough to join us here in the studio. And uh, I wish you the best uh, of luck in your future. Thanks, Thanks very much. Pleasure thank to be you, here. Ambassador. That was the interview with the Ambassador of the United States of America, who graciously gave us quite a bit of his time, really, to share with us some you know, interesting observations and insights about his uh, period here in Pakistan. Thank you again, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you.